Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Over Analyzes. Today, we are taking a look at season one, episode two of The Bad Batch, Cut and Run. My first reaction is fairly simple. These writers human very well. They know how to write believable people. Each character is in character, and yet never quite fully predictable as people are in real life. The children are childlike, the fathers might be your own dad, and the mothers exude the thousands of little maternal quirks that mark true motherhood. The character interactions alone were a joy to watch. Now, the plot was 100% predictable. You have seen this episode before, I have seen this episode before, and neither you or I care one whit about the fact that we've seen it before. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, no one who cares about being original will ever be original. Just write a good story and tell the truth, originality will come. Yes, we have seen this episode before, but the art, the acting, and the plot are so well executed that it is a joy to behold. This episode was a sandwich. A very good, whole grain, protein-rich, fresh veggie with the perfect sauce sandwich. There isn't a single real surprise in it, but if this is the quality of the series, you can bet your bottom pickle slice I'm coming back for more. Now, on to the spoilers. But First, if you need something to hold you over until next Friday, go check out my book of human absurdity, Humans Are Weird. I have the data. It is available on Amazon, Kobo, Google Play Books, and Barnes and & Noble. Our little green friends must figure out how long a human can be allowed to be bored before the explosions start. If you feel more like breaking your heart, check out Dying Embers, Dragons, Aliens, and Things That Go Boom in the Night. Now, you have had time to go wipe the dishwater off your hands. Click away if you don't want spoilers. As we expected, the Bad Batch had for the homeworld of the deflector clone cut and his family that we first met back in the Clone Wars. Their reasoning being that they don't know how to lay low, while cut Laquane has been lying low for su successfully for years. Of course, things don't go as planned. Cut and Sue are just about ready to pull up stakes and leave their little farm. Now, there are some interesting twists in the story. The biggest threat to the families we are cheering for is not exactly direct violence, but these new chain codes. The same codes that are a problem for Cara Dune and Baby Yoda in The Mandalorian. Here we see their introduction into the galaxy. The Empire wants to keep track of their citizens, so they require each citizen to have their genetic scanned and put on record in a chain code. It doesn't appear to be required, but if they want to travel, they have to have one. If they want to buy things, they have to have one. Now, with the constant threat of vaccine passports hanging over our global heads and the concept of not being able to fly unless you subject your very DNA to the whims of the government being an all-too-real threat, this might seem a bit topical and on the nose, something that will pass and be passé in a few years' time, like the cheesier bits of pulp science fiction, laser guns, and physical media, like MySpace references. But in reality, the imperial demand to know who you are and what you are doing is a very old concept. 2,000 years ago, it was recorded as the mark of the beast, an unjust government demanding that you bow to them or you won't be able to buy or sell, i.e. those credits are useless without a chain code. When Gandhi rose in rebellion against the British Empire, one of the main injustices he rebelled against was the identification paperwork that every Indian citizen was required to carry. This is a very old, very universal concept, and I think it will easily stand the test of time, even if it does seem very topical now. It makes me wonder, too, is the Mandalorian or the Rangers of the New Republic going to address the concept that the New Republic is carrying on an institution that was deliberately created by the Empire to get control over the population. Cara Dune couldn't really travel until Grief Cargo pulled some strings for her. We will see. Now, onto the little bump of irritation Omega left for me as her status as the forced-in Kid Appeal character. That? That's gone, baby. Gone like a freight train, gone like yesterday, gone like a trooper in the Civil War Bang Bang, as the song says. Omega isn't, or isn't just, a Kid Appeal character. She is a wonderfully acted child. She feels real, natural, and she fits into the story. In my life, I've known several children, especially girls, who came out of overly protected, overly sanitized, nearly sterile environments. Their parents would freak out in dirt and germs, and they passed that fear on to their daughters, leaving the girls awkward, fearful, and often shy. Clearly, these writers have seen that kind of psychology, too. We didn't see it in the last episode because Omega was in her element. She was interacting in the environment she was decanted in. So she was calm and confident in almost everything she did. In this episode, she is entirely out of her native element and it shows. She isn't a germaphobe, as one might expect from someone raised in a hospital environment, but she is awkward and unsure in every movement. When she was faced with something terrifying, something she didn't understand, she reacts like a child would and shuts 
cuts down in desperate need of comfort and the encouragement of the father. The real star of the show, however, is Hunter. The acting that the animators put into this character is amazing, just the way his face moves. If Omega is out of her element, then Hunter is doubly so. He has no idea what to do with this small, fragile child. He feels inadequate to the task, and for good reason. And in this very classic, overused, common trope, the show addresses a massive, glaring moral question that has plagued the entire franchise since Obi-Wan first landed soaking wet on the Kamino main clone factory child soldiers. The concept that the clones were children, not even teenagers when they were sent into battle. Canonically, the clones were considered fully grown at 10 years old, and the vast majority of them were brutally gunned down before they turned 13. Without being heavy-handed or preachy, this dynamic between Hunter and Omega underscores just how wrong that is. We don't know how old Omega is exactly, but if she is already so different from her brothers, it is plausible to assume that she didn't get the accelerated growth formula and is the same age as the other members of the Bad Batch. Recall not one of them, not Wrecker, Hunter Tech, or even the senior Echo, is over 15 years old. Given that they were experiments and... They probably came later after the Kaminoans were more confident in their process of creating the regular clones. Hunter might be closer to 10 than 15. They never had a childhood. They never have a family other than their brothers. They want, at least Hunter comes to want, something better for Omega. He wants her to have what Cut has given Sue's children. A stable family. Two parents. Peace. And you see kind of the tragedy of this written in Cut's gray hair. Remember, Cut himself isn't over 20, and yet his hair is already graying because of his accelerated aging. I wonder if one of the reasons he wants so badly to get Sue and the children to a safe place is that he knows he won't be around for them very much longer. Of course, the episode is predictable, but it is so wonderfully executed. On a side note, I had thought that this was going to be a darker show in terms of, you know, technical lighting, but as soon as they got to the farm, the lighting was golden grain field bright, if you know what I mean. That, that's a good sign. It is far cheaper and easier to do dark lighting in CG shows. That's why, you know, like Godzilla is often, sh is often hidden behind clouds and fog and smoke. This is the show, this brightly colored scene that was kind of uh, almost unnecessary. Walking through a golden crop field isn't a, wasn't strictly necessary, but this is a show of resources that bodes well for the continued quality of the show. Remember what the lighting was like when Rex landed on this planet in the Clone Wars? It was darker, it was night, it was dusk. So they've clearly, they have a lot of resources for the show and they're showing them off. So those are my thoughts on the second episode of The Bad Batch. If you want something to keep you occupied until the third episode drops, follow the link in the description to my book, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, A Book of Human Absurdity, or Dying Embers, Dragons, Aliens, and Things That Go Boom in the Night. Meanwhile, peace out, my wonderful viewers. The book from author Betty Adams, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, is a humorous look at human behavior through the eyes of aliens. This book is arranged in separate reports or essays, documenting the experiences with humanity through the lens of the aliens who have to interact with them. This anthology of short stories and vignettes from alien points of view highlights some of humanity's quirks we can all relate to. Author Betty Adams captures how strange and interesting humans can really be. This is a fun collection of stories you will really get a kick out of. Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data from author Betty Adams. Order your copy right now on Amazon.